Hello, soon to be licensed nurse practitioners, Ms. Cohen here. And today we're going to be going over the EKG interpretation review. The reason for coming up with this lecture is because regardless which exam you're going to take, it's been known that it may have an EKG strip that you need to interpret. And even though EKG reading and interpretation can be quite complex, what I have done here for you is narrow it down to the very basics of what you need to know for the purposes of passing the nurse practitioner boards. So let me show you. The very beginning is understanding what is happening with the P, QRS, and T waves and what they mean. In this case, it's all about electrical uh, conductivity. So the SA node, as you'll see in my picture there, is the beginning of the electrical uh, impulse that causes the atria to contract followed by the activation of the AV node, which is the contraction of the ventricles. This electricity, as you can see, the conduct goes down what we call the bundle of his, and it gets distributed to both sides of the bottom part of the heart, the right bundle branch and the left bundle branch. These electrical impulses is what causes the contraction of these parts of the heart. Now the P wave and the QRX are, uh, QRS, excuse me, are the contractions. You'll see on the picture again that as soon as it activates, it contracts the atria for the, for the um, SA node, and then the AV node contracts the ventricles, and that's how we pump the heart. The T wave, it's the relaxation period, okay? And here on the diagram on the bottom right, you'll see that you, will, you should have on a normal sinus uh, rhythm, you should see a P wave, which is the contraction of the atria, followed by a QRS, which is the contraction of the ventricles, followed by the T wave, and this is your relaxation. Very basic stuff. Now, when reading a strip, it's important to understand what these red boxes mean on the background, because that's what we use to measure. Now, one small box, tiny, tiny, smallest box, represents 40 milliseconds time or very, very small. That's all you need to know. Um, then you have these larger boxes. One large box of the five millimeter by five millimeters represents 0 0.2 seconds. Anything going up is the voltage. Anything going across long time is how much time. So how strong for how long? Very basic, stay with me. Now, you could calculate the heart rate in an EKG. I don't necessarily feel that you need to learn how to do this for the purpose of the exam, but you certainly need to understand if something is bradycardic versus tachycardic. So you need to understand how to measure that by looking at the EKG strip. So let me just push you a little bit with this one. Now, the interval between the QRS, remember the QRS is that very high pipe or high wave, the highest of them all. So if you grab the top of one of those high waves and then grab the next one, that time in between is what we call the interval between the QRS complex, is the time between the two peaks. This is how you determine the heart rate. Um, uh, in a cardiac rhythm. So what you do, there's the calculation. You can divide it by 300, um, divide 300 by the numbers of large boxes between the two consecutive QRS complex to calculate the actual heart rate. So in this case, for example, from this top to this top, there's one box, 300. From this top to this top, we're calling 150, and then so on. For example, again, if the interval between the QRS complex is two large boxes, then the rate is 150 beats per minute, 300 divided by two, because it's two boxes, is 150, okay? But again, take this with a grain of salt. Let me show you a more simple way. I mean, you, you can kind of tell, right? If the spaces are wider in between, there's more time versus very close to each other. It's very fast, the contractility. If you have 300, 150, the heart is beating very fast, but if you have much wider spaces in between, it's taking longer for a contraction. And if it takes longer, therefore it's slower. 
So when looking at an EKG strip, you need to ask yourself, is the rhythm regular? And what that means is that is the spaces between the QRS about the same, plus or minus? Because if you see ones that are too close and then a wide space and then close again and then a wide space, that's irregular. But if you see a P QRS T complex that it's about this equidistant from each other by measuring the boxes in between, like for example, this picture right here, there's about one, two boxes and a half. And then look at the second from the third, one, two boxes and a half. That's a regular rhythm. Now, a normal rhythm would be or a normal heart rate would be anywhere between 60 to 100, roughly. Tachycardia, anything above 100. Bradycardia would be less than 60. All right, so you would wanna calculate the heart rate looking at the boxes in between the QRS complex. Now you certainly wanna look at the P waves because sometimes you may not see them. So check, is there a P wave? Now remember that P wave is the wave right before the QRS, and then it's followed by a T. So check and see if there's a P wave. Does each P wave follow a QRS? And the same thing for the T wave. Is there a T wave? It tells you a lot of information. Does the P wave look normal? The duration of time, are they absent? Is the T wave, is the P wave, for example, too close to the QRX? You wanna make sure there's that space in between. If not, it's something to consider. And assess the PQ interval prolongation. So again, looking at the spaces between one versus the other. So let's look at an example. This would be sinus bradycardia. Now, sinus bradycardia to a heart rate of less than 50. The rhythm should be regular, and the P waves are constantly preceding the QRS complex. So let's look at this. When you look at the spaces between the QRS, one, two, three, four, five, about six. One, two, three, four, five. Okay, about six. That tells you it's regular. And the spaces in between are quite large, which tells you the heart rate is about 50. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. Okay, but there is a P wave, the rhythm is regular, and their heart rate is slow. Now this, it's the opposite. It's sinus tachy. Tachy meaning that it's very fast. Look at the spaces in between the QRS complex. It's about a box and a half, box and a half, box and a half, box and a half. That's very fast. That's how you know that this heart rate is fast. In this case, greater than 100 beats per minute, which makes it tachy. But again, the rhythm is regular. That's what makes it sinus, sinus Bring, make, makes it regular. Sinus makes it regular. Can't say that enough. P waves with constant preceding QRX, every QRX. So you'll see a P wave, QRS, P wave, QRS. I'm not sure there's a T wave on this one, but the purposes of this image is to show you primarily the spaces in between the QRS complex, which give away that it's a fast, tacky rhythm. All right, so let's talk about some dysrhythmias, such as atrial dysrhythmias. Whenever there's an atrial dysrhythmia or an issue, it means that there's a problem with the P wave. Remember we said a P wave has to do with the contraction of the atria, which the SA node is the one in charge of doing. So I bring to you this picture again, um, but there's a difference between sinus tachy and what we call supraventricular tachycardia. Let me get that out of the way quickly. So a sinus tachycardia would be a fast heart rate of about 100 to 150 beats per minute. Supraventricular tachycardia, it's worse. It usually is above 151 beats per minute. It could reach up to 250 beats per minute, okay? Even though I'm using the same picture, um, I just wanted to make that differentiation so that you don't uh, think it's the same. So. Atrial dysrhythmia, supraventricular, supraventricular, above the ventricle. There's an issue above the ventricle and it's fast. That's what the name tells you, supraventricular tachycardia. There's clearly a problem um, up top. It could be the SA node, the AV node, most likely will be the um, SA node. All right, the SVT rate, it's usually above 150. 
the P wave is hidden behind the previous QRS. So in this case, we're most likely looking at the T wave. It's so fast that the actual reading doesn't pick up the P wave. But again, typically it is a regular rhythm. So what do you need to know about this particular EKG strip? It's understanding that it's a fast or tachycardia um, slip. And it is so fast that in this case, you can recognize that P wave. Um, so consider it to be a supraventricular tachycardia strip. Now with this one, a flutter or a flutter, atrial flutter. The key thing for you to take home with this one, and please pay attention again, whenever you see something bolded in green in the coin review green, it's something that it is extremely important for you to understand. When looking at a flutter, you will see multiple P waves. The pattern looks like sawtooth pattern. Do you see this in between the QRS? The QRS complex may not be super um, clear, but because it's taller, you can assume that's the QRS. But look at that sawtooth pattern of the P waves. That is classic of a flutter. If you see an EKG strip on the exam that has this sawtooth pattern, you know it will be a flutter, period. More Ps than QRS, and the pattern can be regular or irregular. Sawtooth pattern, a flutter. AFib or atrial fibrillation. That is when the atrials are quivering, literally doing this. It doesn't have a fast rhythm, it's quivering. So there's no consistency in the P waves. It's not nicely measured. As you can see in this picture, before um, the QRS, there's a quiver. This looks like what you see here in the EKG strip, not this, this, that's quivering, all right? It's what they say that it looks like a doctor's signature in a five-year-old scribble, kind of. The R to R waves are irregular, not equidistant, and there are narrow QRS complex, but the giveaway, AFib, is that the atria is quivering, no consistent P waves. Ventricular dysrhythmias, these are dangerous. So now we're looking at the QRS complex or the AV node, which is what activates that contraction of the ventricles. Ventricular tachycardia, also known as VTAC. Because it's tachycardia, it's a fast rate. There's a wide QRS complex. You won't see P waves, you won't see T waves. The R to R waves are equidistant, but the one thing you want to make sure you do here is check the patient for a pulse. May or may not have one. Pulse may not last long. So this diagram right here, if you see large waves with no P or T waves on, next to it, like a nice clean PQRS T complex, think of ventricular tachycardia. Now, Ventricular fibrillation or BFib, not good at all. The ventricles are quivering, and that is extremely dangerous because the ventricles are the ones in charge of pumping the heart to the rest of the body. If the ventricles are not working, your body is in trouble because it's not receiving blood or it's not pumping fluid correctly, the blood. Ventricles are quivering, ventricles are not pumping. There won't be a pulse, run, hold, CPR, shock. Look at the uh, strip. It's not telling you anything. There is no P, there is no QRS, there is no T wave. It is just a scribble of something is happening, but we don't know what the hell is going on. Different from the ones I've shown you earlier. Now, STEMI and non-STEMI. The reason why it's important to recognize these is because we're talking a heart attack in the, um, in, the, in the strip. So ST elevation, myocardial infarction. Why is this important? Because it means that the muscle, the heart muscle, is not getting oxygen. And when the heart muscle doesn't get oxygen, it dies. 
and we don't want any part of the heart to die. It's a severe type of heart attack during which one of the heart's major arteries is blocked. Time is muscle. There's no oxygen, muscle damage. This is what that looks like. So remember how QRS was up, down, and then back. Here, there's like a little extra addition to the QRS. It's elevated, ST. QRS, S is the top. From the S to the T, there's an elevation. That's what it means. A non-STEMI will present differently on the EKG. Pay attention to the ST depression or the T inversion. It causes less damage than a STEMI, but it is a heart attack, acute coronary syndrome. So when you look at the strips, you may see the QRS, and then remember how it would be on the same line and then a T. Here there's an ST depression, or you may actually see a T inversion. And it's important to recognize these as it is a form of a heart attack. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope that you have enjoyed the EKG interpretation video. This is the simplest form I could create for you. Um, clearly, there's a lot more to know about EKG reading, but for the purposes of the nurse practitioner exam, regardless which test you're going to take, this is the foundation of what you need to know. And these are the strips that you need to recognize.